Hello, fellow collectors. Frank here, back with another TTM success video. TTM standing for Through the Mail Success Autographs. I have three in the box today. Three in the box. Um, today is Tuesday, January 19th. This is the evening before Inauguration Day in the United States. So tomorrow's a big day in the U.S. No matter what your outlook is about the election and whatnot, it is a big day. But I'm, but I'm not here to talk about the transfer of power. I'm here to talk about some TTMs. And I have some TTMs today with some, actually with some powerful stories. So looking forward to doing this today. Uh, thank you for joining me. I hope everybody's having a good week. Um, so I have three in the box, like I said. Let's get right at it here. First in the box here, we got a one for one in 12 days. No fee out of Lee Valley, Pennsylvania. We have Mr. Bob Hepner. Looking nice here on this 1964 Tops. Black ink. We have Mr. Robert Frederick Hefner, otherwise known as Bob Hefner, or by the nickname Butch, who was born September 13, 1938, in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Mr. Hefner was a 6'4 right handed pitcher who played five seasons in the majors with the Boston Red Sox, mainly from 63 to 65. Cleveland Indians, brief stints with the Cleveland Indians, 66, and a brief stint with the Angels, California Angels, in 1968. He was signed by the Boston Red Sox in June of 1957. A recent graduate of Allentown High School where he was a two-sport star in basketball and baseball. During high school, he was given the nickname Butch by the school's radio broadcaster. After five seasons in the Red Sox minor league system, a mostly successful starter, he made his major debut, debut at the age of 24. He started, at, started a Wednesday afternoon game on June 19, 1963 at Fenway Park in Boston versus the Detroit Tigers. He pitched a complete game, just allowing two runs, seven hits, striking out six, and walking four, earning the win in a 9-2 win for the Red Sox. Heffer completed the 63 season with the Red Sox winning four, losing nine with a 4.26 ERA in 20 games and 19 starts. With the seventh place pitching depleted Red Sox in a need of good arms, Heffer was in plans for the Red Sox in 1964. Then manager Johnny Piskey said, he was only 4-9, but he pitched better than that. We didn't give him any runs. In 64, Hefner got in a full year's work, appearing in 55 games, including 10 starts, and 21 game finishes as a reliever, winning 7 and losing 9 with a 4.08 ERA. The Red Sox, however, did not improve from the season before, finishing in 8th place, and Johnny Pesky was fired, being replaced by Billy Herman in 65. Herman's intent was to use Hefner as a reliever and spot starter, more or less, the same role at under Pesky. Heffner appeared to be going into the 65 season with expectations of continued Major League success. However, Heffner had a tough spring train and twisted his knee. Perhaps due to the injury, he did not pitch great early in the season, was sent to the minors to work things out in May returning in early July. In a game in late July, he pulled a limited ligament, pitching in relief during a game versus the California Angels, missing two weeks. He ended the season with a 7.16 ERA in 27 appearances, starting just one game. The Red Sox finished in ninth place. In October 65, Hefner's contract was sold outright to the Red Sox farm team AAA Toronto Maple Leaf. At the end of November, the Cleveland Indians purchased his contract for Toronto in, in the Rule 5 draft. For the next three seasons, Hefner spent most of the time in, in Cleveland and California Angels minor league system with brief stints in the majors in 66, with the Indians in 68 with the Angels. One highlight during the stint with the minors was he pitched a no-hitter with the AAA Seattle Angels on May 9, 1967 versus the visit in Tacoma Rainers, although Seattle lost in extra innings. For his career, Mr. Hefner had 11 wins, 21 losses, with a 4.51 ERA, with 114 game pitch, 31 starts, and 353 and one thirds innings pitch. So, very nice. Thank you so much, Mr. Hefner. It is quite appreciated. Next to the box here, we have a one for one in 12 days, no fee. Sent that out the same day as Mr. Hefner from Jackson, Mississippi. We have. Mr. Dalton Jones, 
black ballpoint pen on this 1965 tops, and he has some questions which I will get to. We got a good story here about Mr. Jones here. James Dalton Jones, other one known otherwise known as Dalton Jones. Born December 10th, 1943, in Bacomb, Mississippi. He is 77 years young. He grew up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Mr. Dalton was a left-handed, right-handed, throwing second baseman and third baseman, later sometimes a first baseman, that played nine seasons in the majors, 64 to 72, mostly with the Boston Red Sox from 64 to 69, then rounded out his career with the Detroit Tigers and the Texas Rangers. While growing up in Baton Rouge, baseball was an integral part of Dalton's young life. Dalton's father, Clinton H. Jones, loved baseball and was his coach from Little League through American Legion Ball. His father had played in the minors in the 1930s. A first baseman, he won the Baton Crown in 1934 playing Class D ball and made it as far as Class A in 1935, but his career was ended by an arm injury. Dalton's great uncle, Leroy Cowboy Jones, played in the Texas League. The family often took traveling vacations to baseball destinations to watch the big league team, to St. Louis to watch the Cardinals. They traveled to Kansas City, even to Cleveland, to see the Red Sox play on the road. Consequently, as a youngster, Delta became a Stan Musial fan and a Ted Williams fan. The Jones family was present in Cleveland when Ted Williams tied, then passed Mel Ott for third place on the Major League career home run list. From an early age, Dalton wanted only to be a Major League Baseball player. Dalton was a star shortstop in high school in Baton Rouge and after graduation in 61, signed with the Red Sox for a $60,000 bonus, $60, bonus considerable amount in the, those days. Jones made his Major League debut on April 17, 1964, the home opener at Fenway Park. He contributed his first Major League hit, an RBI triple. It came in the third inning off a White Sox hurling. Joel Hurlin. The Red Sox went on to beat the White Sox 4-1 in a game that also featured another Red Sox rookie, Massachusetts native Tony, Lee, Tony Caliguero, who hit the, his first pitch he saw at Fenway Park for a home run. The next day, also at Fenway, Jones hit his first Major League home run, a solo shot in the ninth off a White Sox left-handed Don Mosey. After the game, Boston manager Johnny Pesky called Dal Dalton's dad, Clinton Jones, to celebrate Dalton's home run. During his tenure with the Red Sox, Dalton hit well in pressure situations, compiling a 271 batting average in pinch hitting role. He remains the Red Sox all-time pinch hitting leader with 55 hits. Jones finished his nine-year major league career with a 235 batting average, 41 homers, and 237 RBIs. He batted 262 in his career as a pinch hitter. When he retired, his 81 pinch hits placed him second all-time among American League pinch hitters. However, there's more to the story here with his baseball success. Mr. Jones made a, perhaps his biggest contribution to his team, swept years after his Major League could, Baseball career playing for the Senior League Baseball. And I'll get that into just a moment. First, I'm going to have answer some of these gonna tell you what how he answers some of these questions I ask him mr. Jones who's your favorite Red Sox teammate shortstop Rico Petroselli so he played in the infield with Petroselli who was the toughest pitcher you had success against he says I seem to remember hitting hitting against Sam McDowell pretty good so remember that name Sam McDowell as I go forward the rest of the story was there anyone along the way that helped you succeed the most during your Major League Baseball career? My dad by far, indeed. So as I said before, 1989, he played Senior League Baseball. So Jones was an infield and coach for the Winter Haven Super Sox team in the Senior League in 1989. Managed by former Red Sox pitcher, Spaceman Bill Lee. Jones's teammates included Fergus, Hall of Famer Fergus Jenkins, Gary Allenson, and another former Red Sox, Bernie Carbo. Bernie had been through some troubles. Carbo had struggled with drug addiction since his playing days and just lost his mother to suicide. One day, Jones met Carbo at a swimming pool in Winter Haven, Florida. The account goes is that Jones introduced Carbo to 
faith in Jesus Christ that day, stopping Cabo from a related act on a fatal decision of the end of his, his own life. As Bernie Cabo recounts in an article he wrote, I was a World Series hero her on the brink of suicide, Cabo recounts. During this time, I met a former major leaguer, Dalton Jones, at a swimming pool in Winter Haven, Florida. He told me about Jesus and explained the difference Jesus could make in a life as troubled as mine. I prayed that day, and I believe Jesus began to work it within my heart. Even so, I persisted in using drugs to the point of losing all hope. Sitting in my home, I was ready to take my own life. There's Carble there. I felt I had tried everything, and I was I was worthless. Then the phone rang. It was Bill Lee, a teammate of mine when I played for the Red Sox. He connected me with Ferguson Jenkins, another player whom I played had been close with. Fergie, Fergie as we called him, had recently experienced tragedy when he lost his daughter. I couldn't manage to tell him that I was considering suicide, but he could sense that things were serious. For, so Fergie called Sam McDowell, a former, former pro pitcher was working with the baseball assistance team, the organization that helps retired players. Before I knew it, I was in a rehab facility. Carbill eventually became clean from drugs and later on started his own ministry, Diamond Club Ministry, which is dedicated to bringing to the good news of Jesus Christ to young people and their family through faith-based baseball camp and speaking engagements. So thank you so much, Mr. Jones. I do appreciate it. And I definitely am going to send this out to Bernie Carbill as well. This is a senior league baseball card when he played for the um, Super Sox. And I was hoping I had a set of that. And I was hoping that Jones had one as well, but he does not have a one of those cards, as far as I know. So thank you so much, Mr. Jones. Very powerful story. Last in the box here, I have a one for one. This was through a through the mail private signing for $19. I'm considered a TTM, even though it was through a private signing because I got it through the mail. This is out of Boston. And we have Mr. Charlie Scott on a 77, 78 top seat. And as you see in the back here, he has an, an, an pro certificate of authenticity for an autograph of Basketball Hall of Famer Charlie Scott. And that's where I got the card from, www.cardboardpromotions.com. It's a sign-in with January 9th. So, do appreciate that sign-in. So we here we have Charles Thomas Scott, otherwise known as Charlie Scott, or other by the nickname Great Scott. Born December 15th, 1948, in New York, New York. He's 72 years young. And a 28 inductee in the Basketball Hall of Fame, Mr. Scott was a 6'5 guard that played two seasons in the now defunct American Basketball Association, 70 to 72, and eight seasons in the National Basketball Association. NBA from 72 to 80. He played with the ABA with the Virginia Squires from 70 to 72. The, and the NBA played with the Phoenix Suns, the Boston Celtics, the Los Angeles Lakers, and the Denver Nuggets. Scott played college ball at the University of North Carolina, where he, he was the first black scholarship athlete and first African American to join a fraternity at the University of North Carolina. He was a two-time All-American, a three-time All-ACC selection. Scott led the Tar Heels to their second, third consecutive NCAA Final Four appearance in 68-69. He was also a gold medalist in the 68 Summer Olympics playing for the men's basketball team. Scott was drafted by the Boston Celtics in 1970, but had already signed a contract with the Virginia Squires of the American Basketball Association. He made his professional debut on Saturday, October 17, 1970, with the Squires versus the Pittsburgh Condors at Old Dominion University Fieldhouse in Norfolk, Virginia. He scored 29 points, leading the team and scoring it into a 133-116 victory. He was named the ABA Rookie of the Year during the 70-71 season after averaging 27.1 points per game. During his second season with the Squires, he set the ABA record for highest scoring average in a season with 34.6 per game. However, 
He became set dissatisfied with the life in the ABA and joined the NBA's Phoenix Suns in 1972. Still belonging to the Celtics, the Celtics acquired Scott in the trade with the Celtics for Paul Sellis. At that point, he briefly went by the name Shahid Abdul Ilam. Scott continued his stellar play in the NBA, representing the Suns in three straight NBA All-Star games, 73, 74, and 75, then was traded to the Boston Celtics for Paul Westfall and two draft picks. With, with the Celtics in the 75-76 NBA season, Scott won a championship ring against the Suns, beat Celtics beating the Suns four games to two. A key member of that team, which included future Hall of Famers Dave Cowens, JoJo White, rest in peace, and John Havacek. He ended his career with the Lakers and the Nuggets. Mr. Scott retired in 1980 with 14,837 combined ABA NBA career points, averaging 20.7 point per game, 4 total rebounds created, and 4.9 assists per game. The ABA and the NBA merged in 76, and both of those stats count towards his career. Charlie is also the father of Shannon Scott, who was a guard for Ohio State from 2011 to 2015. So, if you want to take a look here, this is some upcoming signings through Cardboard Promotions. Very good. I've had two good successes through them. Do recommend it. Anyways here, I had a lot of good ones today. I know I went on kind of long here, but I thought some really good story, stories to sh share here. Hope everybody's doing, everybody's doing well. You know, I just wanted to say something as well. I hear some, some, some collectors in the community are talking about, you know, we want to leave YouTube and, you know, social media and whatnot I want to say if you're thinking about doing that for whatever reason that is I know people have reasons for doing that you know I say stick around stick around this is important here you know these connections we're making um, I enjoy doing this and collecting the cards getting the autographs you know learning about these players I'm always researching I mean I'm learning so much about these players that I never thought I would. I'm learning so much about other other people in the collecting community. It's good these connections, kind of like these stories that we tell. You never know the connections in, in you make in life and how that's influenced others. And it would be a shame to see some good people go and leave the community. You know, just, you know, for whatever reason that is. Anyways, want to go on and on about that. Hope you're all well. Just want to say take care. God bless. Peace.